Hello and welcome to Living Truth, a media ministry of the People's Church. Wherever you're tuning in from, we're thrilled that you've decided to join us for our time of worship as we grow in God's Word together. Today we're hearing from our discipleship pastor, Andrew Stewart, on the sufficiency of Christ. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 16 as we join him for today's message. Well, good morning, church. My name is Andrew, and uh, as we do prepare to hear God's word, I invite you to get a Bible out as we open the word today. We are continuing our series in Matthew's gospel. And so whether you're on a device or a hard copy or whether you're joining us online, have that open to Matthew chapter 16. We're gonna be reading from verses one to 12. Matthew 16, verses one to 12. Faith is a big theme in this section of Matthew. Last week, if you were here, we considered a woman of great faith, and this week, uh, Jesus is going to say something about his disciples' faith. So just hold on to that as we get into the word, Matthew 16, verses 1 to 12. It says this, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They discussed amongst themselves and said, it is because we didn't bring any bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, you of little faith, Why are you talking amongst yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. This is God's word for us. So as I said, faith is a big theme in this passage. And we're really approaching a turning point in Matthew's gospel. And we've been tracking with the disciples as they are slowly and surely getting it and sometimes not so much getting it. This time, it's the Pharisees and Sadducees. These groups in those days were not usually allied. They were usually on the opposite end of things, enemies of one another. The Pharisees were these kind of staunch religious conservatives. They were the safeguarders of the Torah. And the Sadducees were kind of the political liberals of their day, very different in their theology from the Sadducees. They were in charge of the temple. They had tons of money and they wielded a lot of influence. Jesus is on the scene announcing and demonstrating the kingdom of heaven and they come together and they say, okay, we we gotta put our beef aside. Let's deal with this Jesus and they come. And now most of your Bibles say they ask for a sign from heaven, but it's actually a stronger word. It's demand. That's the force of the text. This is like an inquisition. It's an interrogation. Jesus, perform, show us beyond a doubt that you are who you say you are, that you are from heaven, and then we'll believe, we'll support you. But Jesus doesn't play that game. In fact, his answer here is the exact same as in Matthew 12. He tells them a wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign. He calls them evil. 
marriage-breaking, unfaithful. These were like the elders' board of his day. Yikes. And what he's doing in this statement is actually throwing a line back to the Old Testament. A lot of his hearers would have heard that those words, wicked and unfaithful generation, and gone back to historical Israel, where God had rescued them from their slavery in Egypt for over 400 years. They were this conquered people. Egypt was a military economic superpower oppressing God's people, and God leads them out with wonders, signs, miracles. And at the climax of the story in Exodus 15, Moses actually sings this song. It's called the Song of the Sea. And get what he says. He says this, the Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. Like, what a declaration of faith. What a declaration of praise. But what happens is it doesn't take long until hardship sets in and God's people start to grumble and rebel. Check it out, Exodus 16, just after the Song of the Sea in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. What happened to the faith of Exodus 15? Just evaporated. They've just sung, the Lord is my strength and my defense, and now they're accusing Moses, and by extension God, of leading them to their death. God didn't lead them out there to kill them. And so God gives them manna, miraculous bread from heaven. He provides. And then the very next chapter, they start to grumble about a lack of water. They're thirsty, and God again provides. But even after Egypt and the deliverance, there's no faith. They're not trusting that God is actually going to care for them. Can you see the pattern? Really, this is traced over the whole Old Testament story, that at the heart of that storyline is, is a really dynamic tension between the creator God on the one hand, who created his people and wants them to know him and trust him in intimate communion, and on the other hand, the people themselves who keep God at a, a distance. And they act as if God himself is not enough for them. He wants them to know him. He wants them to know, hey, I'm with you. I'm your king. You don't need another king like the other nations have. I'm your provider. I'm your shield. I'm your strength. I'm your wisdom. I will keep you in covenant love. But over and over and over again, God's people keep him at a distance. And they say, by their living, you are not enough. So fast forward with me back to Matthew. I want you to take your finger or your thumb if you're scrolling and put your finger on Matthew 16. Okay, that's our text today. If you look in your Bible just before or scroll up just before, you're gonna see a story at the end of Matthew 15 uh, where Jesus is in the countryside on a mountain by the Sea of Galilee and crowds come to him. He heals them. And then he feeds them. And get this, he feeds 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread and a few fish. Manna from heaven, miraculous bread. And then this story about the Pharisees. Okay, give us a sign. Do you see what Matthew's doing here? He's putting these two stories together to communicate to us that seeing signs is not what leads to faith. God's people saw his signs, yet they did not believe. And the religious leaders are doing the same thing. I mean, surely they had heard. Maybe they had even seen Jesus doing these things. And yet it wasn't enough. They needed more. Signs don't lead to faith because a sign is only one half of the equation. The other half is our interpretation. So here's a sign that you probably see if you have a car. Every 5,000 kilometers or so, uh, it's the change oil light that turns on. 
So that's a pretty clear sign, right? You see that, you go, okay, something's going on. Now, how do you interpret that sign? What, what do you do in response to it? If you're like me, you go, okay, I gotta book an appointment, I gotta go to the mechanic to change my oil. This is telling me something important and I need to respond. Now, there are probably some of us out there who doubt this or who think, oh, this is just a money-grabbing scheme. Like, come on, oil, filter, plus labor? Come on, Honda, you're just trying to get my money. I've even heard of people who didn't know what it was, and so they stuck a piece of tape there because they were worried like it was bothering them, right? The sign is clear, but we need to interpret it right. The sign is only one half of the equation. What do you make of it? How do you interpret it? And that's why Jesus says in verses two and three to the Pharisees and Sadducees, you, can't inter- you can interpret the sky, right? You can see the sky and predict the weather, but you can't interpret the signs of the times. That word interpret means to discern or evaluate. It, it means you have to make a decision. See, sometimes we want God to provide a sign so that we don't have to make the decision. That's never what happens. You always have to decide. The signs of the times. Now, what's Jesus talking about there? Because some of us are like, ooh, now's the chance I get to take out my apocalyptic time frame table and make some calculations. No, 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 put it back, please. What Jesus is doing is he is saying the appointed time for God's redemptive plan has come to a head. I am now here And the time spoken of in the prophets and in the scriptures where God would send his king to come and break his kingdom into history is now here. It's here, folks. It's here, and I don't want you to miss it. That's why Jesus doesn't give them a sign because he himself is the reality. And church, as we read this story, It can be really easy to look at the Pharisees and Sadducees and say, thank the Lord I'm not like them, right? But not so fast. In verse five, Jesus leaves them. He goes across the lake with his disciples and they forget to take bread. And Jesus uses this opportunity to teach them a really important lesson. He says, watch out and beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, he's not talking about the good yeast of the kingdom from Matthew 13. This is bad yeast. This yeast is like a sickness in our souls. And so his disciples discuss among themselves. They, they hear the word yeast and they go, hey guys, what's Jesus saying? Oh, it's because we didn't bring any bread. Oh, we should have brought bread. And Jesus brings them back. Oh, you of little faith. It's like this face palm moment. And I'm just so glad Jesus is so patient with his disciples. It's like, guys, you're not getting it. And he asked that question, do you still not understand? Do you not remember how many leftovers we had when I fed 5,000 people? Do you not remember how many leftovers we had when I fed 4,000 people, like right before this? And then he says the exact same thing, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And friends, just a helpful note for you as you learn to read the Bible for yourself, whenever Jesus says something verbatim twice, listen up, it's important. So what's the lesson? Again, he's with his disciples and and maybe for us, we need to be listening up as his disciples today. He says, you've seen more signs and miracles than anyone. You've been following me for the last three years. You know me better than anyone. You've eaten the miracle bread. Watch out for the yeast. Yeast is something small. It's just a little thing. It starts small, but then it spreads exponentially. Uh, And that's the point Jesus is making. Small, but spreads. Watch out for the yeast. And what he's saying is, okay, you've got the Pharisees and the Sadducees over here. And what is full blown in them, the disease that is fully taken over, might also be in you, in yeast form. Watch out. You might not be demanding signs from me, 
You might not be confronting me and actively opposing me, but your fixation and your worry about bread shows that you don't believe that I am enough for you. That's what Jesus is saying. Do you not understand? Do you not remember? Do you not see that I'm with you, that I'm the source? You see, the Pharisees and Sadducees are seeking more signs, and he tells them the only sign they're gonna get is the sign of Jonah, which is actually about himself. Jonah was in the belly of a sea monster for three days. Jesus went into the grave for three days and rose again. He's saying, I am the reality, and my cross is the sign. And now his disciples are seeking more, more bread. It's not more signs, it's more bread. And Jesus is like, guys, don't you get it? I'm the bread from heaven. I'm the bread of life, to use John's language. And I'm standing right in front of you. Church, I want you to think about your life. What's your bread? What's the thing that you're lacking that is is turning your gaze away from the sufficiency of Christ and, and getting you caught up in the insufficiency at work in your life? I mean, honestly, maybe for some of us, it's you're lacking literal bread. I mean, have you been to the grocery store lately and seen the prices? Maybe some of us are lacking moral resources. Maybe some of us are caught up in habits that we cannot break and cannot change on our own. Maybe some of us lack energy. Maybe some of us lack answers and clarity for life's direction. Maybe some of us lack faith. And we're here this morning just just seeking for something, for someone. Or maybe you lack the, the internal resources to process the news cycle of this past week and all the things that have been happening in our city and in our world that are deserving of our lament. What is your bread? What's the thing that's in your life that you lack that you're focusing on? I want you to use your imagination If it helps you, close your eyes and just put yourself in this story with Jesus' disciples. Jesus is standing in front of you and he's asking you, do you not understand? Why are you still talking about not having any bread? Do you see Jesus meeting your need, meeting your lack with himself? Do you know who I am? Do you know what I've done? And we have the blessing of standing on this side of the cross. God has given all, and not only that, God has poured out his Holy Spirit so that his presence, the presence of Jesus, might go viral and be among his people, indwelling his church and indwelling you and I who belong to Christ. Christ is with you. Christ is in you. People of God, do we know this? I love this quote from Frederick Dale Bruner. He says, it's the constant temptation of discipleship to look at what we have as if that is of final importance and not at whom we have. Our insufficiency is not the problem. The problem is unbelief in the sufficiency of Christ. Whatever that bread is in your life, don't think that's the problem, because Christ is sufficient. The problem is not our insufficiency, it's unbelief in the sufficiency of Christ. And church, isn't that just such good news? That we don't have to come to church and be hyper-spiritual like the Pharisees, try to earn our righteousness, try to demand more signs, or even worry about bread. Jesus calls us to this rhythm of trust, of easing back into his presence and saying, Christ, you are enough. You are sufficient. It's such good news. But friends, For us as a global church on mission with Jesus, this is crucial. And in terms of your personal participation, the problem is not our insufficiency. The problem is unbelief in the sufficiency of Christ. Do we not know that this is his church? 
Do we not know that this is his world? Do we not know that the kingdom has broken in with power and he is making all things new? Friends, it's such good news. The problem is not your insufficiency. It's unbelief in the sufficiency of Christ. So I want us to think really practically. How do we get there? How do we get that faith to live into his sufficiency? We don't get it from signs. We saw that very clearly. We get it from Jesus himself. If he is sufficient, then his faith is also sufficient. This isn't something we drum up. This isn't something we ply our effort to and believe harder. The faith comes from Christ. He was faithful to God on our behalf, and we can receive his faith also by grace. Check out what it says in Ephesians 2, chapter 8. It says, for it is by grace you have been saved. Amen? Amen. Through faith. And then Paul does this little aside. And by the way, this faith is not from yourselves. It is is the gift of God. Some translations even say it too is the gift of God. And the point is, faith is also grace. It's not self-generated. It's given by God as he reveals himself to us. Friends, if you're here this morning and you're struggling with doubt, in a very real sense, we do not overcome our doubt. God does. And he doesn't do it by giving us proofs and signs. He does it graciously and patiently by revealing himself to us. What has Jesus shown you of himself? Because he is at work. He is showing himself to you. And as he shows himself to us, it's that question he asks his disciples. Do you understand? Now that's an interesting word, isn't it? Understand. Now, understanding requires that we stand under the truth that is being given to us. That's what understanding is. It's not standing over God's revelation and judgment like the Pharisees, right? Give us a sign. It's not standing beside in indifference like the crowds and and even sometimes the disciples. It's standing under in humility and trust, that as Jesus reveals himself to you, you come on your knees like the Canaanite woman. And you say, I'm well aware of my insufficiency, Jesus, I just need you. See, understanding requires a decision to surrender to what Jesus is showing you about himself. And that's what generates faith. God's self-revelation meets with our trusting surrender and faith is born. And the obedience of faith becomes the outflow of our experience. Church, whatever insufficiency is weighing down on you today, Jesus is inviting you to look to him, to know his fullness, to know that he's the bread of life, that he's with you, that he's not gonna let you starve in the desert. And he wants you to want him, if that makes sense. To know that he is enough and to step out into his sufficiency through the grace of the cross, the power of his resurrection in the presence of his Holy Spirit who indwells you. Oh, you of little faith. Why are you talking amongst yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. And Lord, I just ask that you would fill us with your spirit and continue to speak to us and reveal Christ. And Lord, that we would respond with surrender, that we would be able to interpret correctly and have soft hearts that respond to your grace in our lives. Jesus, would you lead us from here into your mission with joyful and obedient faith? Jesus, you're making all things new. Your kingdom is coming. Your motivation to heal and restore and break through is not because you're insecure and you need to prove yourself. Your motivation is that your love is confronting everything that is not love in our world, confronting injustice, 
confronting oppression, confronting the distorted ways that we seek to live. Jesus, we yield to you. Come, Holy Spirit. We pray this all in the mighty name of Christ. Amen. great reminder from God's Word today. If you are feeling led to support or learn more about our ministry, visit us online at livingtruth.ca. You can also call the number on your screen to make a donation. Thanks for joining us today. We're looking forward to worshiping with you again next Sunday.